Josette Kastik, welcome to the Biohacking Secret Show. Thank you for having me. We're going to be talking about healing autoimmunity and specifically like rheumatoid arthritis, some of your journey and how our listeners who may be dealing with some of these challenges themselves or have loved ones that are dealing with them can improve their health and quality of life. But before we do, can you give us a little bit of background, your origin story about how we got here? Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, um, my story actually started about 11 years ago with the diagnosis of RA. Uh, I was diagnosed with severe advanced RA, which was a little strange since it hit me like a brick wall in the middle of the night. I I uh, woke up at around three o'clock in the morning and both my knees were the size of small melons. It was so painful. I didn't know what was going on. We rushed to the ER they did test after test. They couldn't figure it out. Um, I went to several doctors. This is all happening in some sort of chaos because the pain was excruciating. And um, they stuck me with a bunch of uh, steroids and anti-inflammatories and said, you know, you probably should go see. First, they sent me to a neurologist, which I thought was funny because they're like, are you thinking I'm, I'm creating this myself? And then the neurologist was like, what are you doing here? You need to see a rheumatologist. So I went to, this is again, over the course of about two weeks to get all these appointments. I went to a rheumatologist. They did my blood work, came back and said, you know, you have advanced RA. Your numbers are so high that we really predict uh, a prognosis of total disability within a year. We're hoping we can try and slow that down or put you in remission come on in, we'll give you your long list of pharmaceuticals. And th that was it. And it was in that moment where I sat and I went to one rheumatologist that said, you just need to do this, uh, take all these drugs. Sorry, they have some side effects um, and good luck. And it was so cold. A little pat on the butt. See yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, wait a second, wait. I said, you know, I'm a mom. My son is two years old. I have a life. I was a dancer. Uh, I was at um, Joffrey Ballet in New York. Whoa. I had a life of movement. My husband rides uh, horses. He plays polo. So we had horses. I said, I, I, I'm sorry. How did this happen? What is happening to my body? And uh, how do I get out of it? And I didn't get the right answer from the first doctor. So I, I went to six different rheumatoid arthritis specialist, rheumatologists. Mm -hmm. And the last one just scratched his head and looked at me. He goes, you know, this is, there's no way out of this. You will not find a way out. Mm -hmm. just Ambassador, ambassadors of hope. Interesting because I came in, I didn't have a, a spiritual background. I wasn't into any of the woo woo stuff. I was actually, I studied to be a research paralegal, um, which was my, my greatest gift at that point because, but I was so disgusted and disenchanted and honestly heartbroken at the lack of empathy that I was receiving. Um, when I said, please help me find another way, there has to be another way because the, the meds that they were giving me essentially, uh, methotrexate, which is a chemotherapy drug, uh, aims to shut down your immune system. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, that's, that's always a good move you kind of need your immune system. And, <laughs> and, you know, they were like, well, you know, um, you need to stop nursing your child. Don't ever think of having another kid. It'll never happen. Your, your body's just destroying itself rapidly. Just stay out of a wheelchair as long as you can, but we can't guarantee anything. So that's what I was sent home with. And that was my greatest gift, honestly, uh, to get that prognosis. Look at my son, who is my my breath and my life, and the reason I open my eyes every morning is to be with him. My husband thinks it's to be with him. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I love my husband, but um, it's it's my son is my everything. And my son sat on my lap and said, "Why why can't you? Why aren't you holding me? Why aren't you picking me up?" And I I couldn't tell him mommy has a disease. And he looked at me and he said, you're my hero. And those three words, you are my four words, my hero was, it was it for me. And I said, if I'm his hero, I have to show up as his hero. I have to show up as my hero. 
And so I started to do some research and I found uh, a clinic in Switzerland online that was having great success with autoimmune disease, all different kinds of autoimmune disease. I can't remember the name, so I'm sorry. And they talked about a couple of different things. They talked about gut uh, healing with leaky gut and they talked about uh, pH levels. They talked about stress being a... Uh, negative catalysts that cause acidosis in your body. There were all of these different elements and I had been under a lot of stress. Um, there was, there was just a lot going on in my life. I wasn't making the right food choices for sure for my entire life. Mm, and um, so I thought, well, why don't, why don't I start this road here? Uh, and that really was the beginning of it. I, I, I made a decision, a conscious decision to, try and heal myself without taking any of those drugs. It was really painful and it was the greatest teacher of my life to have a disease and then to to come out the other side. And that is ultimately what I ended up doing. Um, I tried everything. I was like my own guinea pig and um, fell on my face quite a few times. And ultimately, about a year in um, to my process, I had no symptoms. I, I remember the day I woke up and nothing hurt, which was the day I danced around the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, two years in, um, I had a doctor who comes to a class that I teach. I ended up um, taking up Zumba to teach Zumba because I wanted to keep movement going. And it was so painful to move that I knew that if I taught the class, I actually had to show up. Mm, um, I did that with yoga. Oh, you did? Yeah, back in the day. I had to keep going, keep going. No, that's was, awesome. Well, and that, exactly it does, that. it forces you to show up. Yeah. Um, I wasn't expecting to make any money off of it. I think I started with three students. But ultimately, the more I healed, the more passion went into my class, the more passion went into my movement, because once you lose something, it becomes so sacred to get it back. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember feeling if I could ever dance without pain, I would never stop dancing. But two years in, uh, after I had no symptoms, one of the, the people that came to my class was an internal medicine specialist uh, here in Santa Barbara, where I live. And she she kind of came to me after class. She goes... I've seen your blood work. I've seen all the times you went for blood work because you went to six or seven different doctors. I said, yeah, they all took my blood. She goes, okay, so there was no mistake in on your prognosis and your diagnosis. So what I'm looking at is impossible. And I said, well, here I am. And she said, can I take your blood again and just see what's going on? So they did. Uh, she sent it down to some friends at UCLA Rheumatology and they sent her a long letter back saying this is impossible. We'd have to declare her a medical miracle. And there you have it. So my passion now is to tell people I'm not a miracle and that we all have the capacity to heal. We're all extraordinary beings and divine sparks. And we just haven't been told of our capacity within ourselves to not only heal our own bodies and heal trauma, but to live moment to moment in extraordinary uh, thriving and happiness. 100%. That's, I mean, that's an awesome story. Uh, appreciate you sharing that with us. Thanks. Yeah. I'm, I'm so grateful to go through it. It's funny when you're going through something like that, you never know what the end result is. And I didn't know. I, I actually had a woman who came, my classes got really popular really quick in Santa Barbara. Um, I went from three students and then I had one Saturday that was 150 students um, showing Whoa. up at my class. Yeah, That's the became, most I've ever heard in like a live group class. Yeah. Well, the, and then the Zumba Corporation came out and did a documentary and they said, okay, they went on they, NPR. They, they came out and wanted, wanted to study you. Yeah. They're like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm yeah. just shaking my derriere like, you know, yeah. I'm meant to. Um, and then I, and then they went on NPR in 2017 and I think it was 2017 and said, there's a girl in Santa Barbara that is literally our most successful instructor in the world. And, and we've never seen anything like it. And to this day, even through COVID, I'm still getting, I'm full on a Saturday morning. I'm absolutely full this Saturday. I think we had 126. 126 for... people at a class. That is absurdly awesome. Um, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> okay. So, so before we're going to, we're going to go deep on, on, uh, rheumatoid arheuritis and, yeah, and, and I wanted to 
I want to put a little caveat in, sorry to interrupt you, is that that's part of what I'm, what I'm representing to people is that you can go, you can create the dreams and the reality that you choose. You, you kind of steer the boat on your life. You, I mean, you might be the most successful group exercise instructor that's ever done it. Do you know anyone who's had bigger classes than that? I don't. No, I have, a, I have somebody in my class that used to take Jane Fonda's class um, back in the day. And she always comes up. She's, Jane never had this many people. Yeah. No, and that's. Like, oh, ooh, that's cool. That's bananas. <laughs> that's bananas. Like if I had like 40 people, I was like, wow. You know, it was so similar to you. Like when I was, I, I've had Lyme disease twice. And when I was coming out of it the first time, yoga was very helpful. Like yoga and saunas and this and that. I had a lot of, I had a lot of pain in my body too. And it was like, I needed to consistently show up for my yoga workouts. My week was better. My life was better. And I started teaching yoga at David Barton gym, you know, a few times a week. And it was like, that would help me to get it in make sure that I was doing it and, and, and whatever. So similar in that, in that capacity on the group exercise front, like if you were to sort of deconstruct your success and like, let's break it down into like the inner inner game and the outer game, you know, the outer game is like the things you do that, you know, pretty much anybody could do that are important in growing a class. And then the inner game is like your energy and your intention. And you know what I mean? What you, what you bring in the efforts and passion that you share, that sort of thing. Like for, for people that are group exercise instructors or health professionals that have classes and want to grow what advice would you give to them if you're kind of deconstructing yourself from a 30,000 foot view? 90% is your inner game. Yeah. Easy, easy. And maybe more, uh, energy is everything. So you have to align and, um, embody the energy that you're trying to create. <clears throat> I mean, and that's manifesting one oh one. So it's, it's, it's just embodying the energy that you're trying to create. I was really, but I think also Which is the easier said than done too. For a lot of people in, in all of quantum and, um, law of attraction stuff, the, the application is a little bit more complicated than the theory and the mm -hmm. theories are there because I think it involves a rewiring for me. Again, I came in as a novice, um, disease made me a little bit less of an amateur. Um, I feel like now 11 years in, I might be close to out of amateur, but I'm no way a pro. So it's a, it's a constant unfolding. I think, mm -hmm. but yes, um, the inner work is everything. It's, it's getting out of your own way. It's trusting yourself without ego. And that's a big deal because people feel that. I think, you know, Martha Graham said that people will remember how you make them feel. They won't remember anything else. And, and they that's remember all what you said. They won't remember what you did, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. And that's it. And the only way you can affect the way somebody feels is by being completely authentic, um, genuine and true to your soul and your passions when you show up. So that requires a, a level of vulnerability, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and also a level of, oh, right. This is the one life I get to live. I am going to show up authentically and without the mass and just as another human, but with all the gifts that I was given. And that's kind of luckily for me, I, I know how to dance. You know, I, I had that in my pocket, but I didn't, mm -hmm. I don't think I'm, I'm not, there's a million people that can dance. So it's not that I'm unique in that, but I feel like I let go. I surrendered and I generated the passion in my heart, the desire to heal and the desire for other people to feel that passion and healing and that joy that I did at that time. So that, that's kind of what I was going to ask you next. And it, it may be the same answer. Um, but like, what is, when well, you're going into a class, what is your intention for the attendees to feel or experience? And, and my apologies if you just answered that. <clears throat> no, I didn't. And it's a great question. I get out of the way. So I recognize that the energy, <clears throat> excuse me, the energy that uh, channels within us all, the, the, whatever you want to call it. I'm, I'm, I'm no spiritual guru, so I don't even know what defines it, but there is a greater energy than me and you that's out there. And I feel you, like you, I'm may, you maybe not. I'm just well, I'm not the humility comes in yeah, is yeah. that you recognize it in yourself, 
but you also recognize that it's in everybody else, whether they're yeah. aware of it or not, it's there. Or and even so, when it's dimmed in someone, you know what they're capable of because like you and I have felt it dimmed in ourselves and been like, man, I know what it's like to feel lit up and illuminated and electric, what healthy and vibrant. I, I want that back. And I see that potential in you, you know? Sorry, and that's it. Off. You just, you just nailed it right there. I, I kind of love to see like when I watch basketball players, you know, and I, I see them just kind of going around the court and they're in their zone, you know, they're not thinking about anything. They're just doing their thing. Mm -hmm. That's where I got, I, I know that when that music gets on, I'm, I'm gone. I'm in my zone. I don't think about anything. My intention before the class is please use me to serve whoever is needed Whoever needs me, whoever needs this feeling, whoever needs to be touched by possibility, by hope, by light, that's it. And there it is. There, That's all. It was that simple and that easy to just get out of the way and be myself and be happy. It seems very woo-woo when I tell people, you just got to get really. in the zone and be happy. What? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. It depends <laughs> who you're talking to, totally. Um, so how much of like... So your history as a dancer, and like Joffrey Ballet is no joke. That's like super high level dancing. So how much of your experience and training and in getting into a flow state and letting go? Like, so you've trained to not only perform, to dance at this like super high level, but then also to achieve this like unconscious competence where you can be super technical and in a flow state. Mm. That's decades of training. How much of that do you to to how much of that do you attribute your success when you then got into Zumba? Mm. I mean, where you can just check out and zone out and crush a workout, and you're like, I don't even know what happened. I blacked out. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. I I would have to definitely admit that my my life prepared me for disease, and it prepared me for where I went with that disease. Um, it, it is effortless for me to dance. It's effortless. Um, mm -hmm. and I know even some of my students were like, did you, did you throw an extra step in there? And what's how you look like you're flying or you're floating. And, and, and I'm like, no, 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 it's a simple, single, single double. You know, I don't, I don't put any technical stuff in yeah. because my class has to be open to anyone. It has to, you have to be able to come into my class and feel so stoked and supported and not intimidated or anything. So mm -hmm. my class isn't difficult, but um, yeah, it's, it was in, I think it's huge that I had that background because it did allow me to enjoy the music and the movement. And I couldn't move in the beginning very much. I mean, I swayed back and forth for a while. I didn't, I didn't have the capacity, the physical capacity to move because I was in so much pain. Mm hmm and then last last question as it relates to your 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 dancing and zumba classes and your gift there if someone wanted to see you in action is there like videos online or where could they go to kind of get a sense for like like i want to see josette do her thing yeah the, well there's stuff on youtube i know i know people have uploaded on youtube i have a youtube channel um but i don't upload a lot i do have classes that are on my website um josette.com uh, but yeah, there's stuff out there. I mean, there's documentaries where you can actually see if you just Google Josette or go on YouTube and Josette Zumba, you'll see there's stuff out there that'll show the class and show the insanity. I was actually dancing on Saturday um, in the class and I I kind of went off to the side to get a cup of water and everybody just kept going. And, you know, it's 120 some people. And I I was standing next to a woman and she's looking at me. I said, you know, they don't really need me anymore. And, you know, they know the choreography and I'm just sitting in the corner drinking the water and everybody's like, oh, and, and then she's like, no, no, you better get out there. We need you. Somebody will get lost somewhere. And it'll, I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> You're like, the students have become the teacher. <laughs> All right. Love it. So look, now let's kind of transition back to rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmunity. And I, I think an, an easy place, an easy entry point here is you mentioned nutrition, which is so critical. Like I had my first uh, rheumatoid arthritis. I had my first client with rheumatoid arthritis in 2015, and she was a neurologist named Rochelle in Chicago. And it had gotten to the point where she couldn't even carry groceries home and it was affecting 
her quality of life and her joy. She was in constant pain. And, and one of the very first things that we did was, you know, we got her on essentially an autoimmune paleo nutritional template. So cutting out grains, cutting out more importantly, the glyphosate and, and the pesticides that are in grains, uh, cutting out the dairy, which is just like a dead food, unless we're talking about raw dairy and, and there's nuance there. How, you, you know, what, what are your nutrient, how did you change your diet in a beneficial manner? Um, and then, you know, kind of how do you recommend people eat that are dealing with physical pain and more specifically autoimmune issues and rheumatoid arthritis? Well, I can tell you that for me, when I did my research, um, it, the pH of food was important. Obviously, the toxins in food is important. So the glyphosate, the the gluten, all of that stuff is not something that you can consume and try and heal at the same time. You just can't mm -hmm. do both. So what I did is I went radical because I was in so much pain and I'm, I'm that person. I, I go 130% overboard when I do things or that I'm passionate about. So I said, okay, what is alkaline? Number one, because I, there's a theory that autoimmune disease, um, that people get acidosis in their body before they get the autoimmune disease, which just means that your cells are literally overdosed with acid, um, whether it be through emotional toxins or, um, dietary toxins so or uh, environmental toxins. It just causes uh, an overload of acid in your cells and we're meant to be alkaline. So I said, okay, greens, vegetables, you know, not fruits, but greens are alkaline. So I literally ate like a rabbit for the first year. I ate nothing but greens and vegetables and salads, mostly raw organic to try. And, and I also got little litmus tests that test your pH, you know, the ones that you pee on in the morning. Yeah. Um, and I, I, do, was, I do it every now and then. Yeah, I was, yeah, I'm sure I was, um, super acidic. So I did that for a year. Um, it wasn't difficult. You know, people, when I tell people, uh, oh, I could never do that. They tell me, oh, I could never do that. It really wasn't that difficult. It was maybe, it maybe was, you're not in enough pain. Yeah, but there it is. <laughs> How badly do you want to walk again? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when you're in that situation, you make choices that have this possibility for you. So mm -hmm. I didn't know I was going to heal. So I ate alkaline, made sure that nothing went into my body. I did not ingest anything that wasn't alkaline. Mm -hmm. And then I started a leaky gut healing protocol um, because leaky gut is also very... Uh, these were the two things that were the major components of autoimmune disease was acidosis and a leaky gut. So then I started the leaky gut healing. Um, and ultimately, funny enough, what was the greatest gift for leaky gut, obviously, you know, probiotics. And there were some amino, amino acids that helped heal the leaky gut, some supplements that you could take. But high grade Manuka honey, a teaspoon. Mm ended up really giving me so much help in terms of healing that leaky gut. So the leaky gut, I'm sure you already know this, but for your listeners, um, is a when there's a perforation in your gut lining and particles can get through and cause an immune response in your body. Mm -hmm. My doctor, when I suggested that I might have leaky gut, he told me to eat yogurt. Bum, bum. And it didn't do anything. Yeah, no. Yeah, you, you need went, a little bit. You went, through, you went through a bunch of good ones, huh? Oh my! God. So that was uh, that was the main two things. But I have to say, Anthony, and I know we're talking about diet here, and it is important. But if I had not done the internal work, the diet wouldn't have made a difference. Might have made me feel a little bit better, but there's it's it's multidimensional. Healing is multidimensional. It's not just. You can eat all greens and then you'll be good. You have to do the the inner work too. Totally. There's there's two things that you know we've found fascinating in our work with clients over the years, especially when there's autoimmune issues present and, and physical pain. The first was brought to my attention through a book called The New Arthritis Breakthrough uh, by Henry Scammell. And he basically showed that most of most cases of rheumatoid arthritis were due to an underlying infection. 
in the body that was undiagnosed. So we're talking about Lyme disease, Bartonella, um, and a, a nutritional template like you're talking about raw, organic, you know, focus on alkaline foods kind of starts to starve those uh, bacteria and also create, you know, an environment where in the body, the body's toxic burden is lowered and you can start moving out not only the, the, the bacterial endotoxins, but the other toxins that we're all exposed to throughout life. So I thought, I thought that was pretty interesting. In his book, he gives cases of people who were bedridden and they were put on a protocol of minocycline, which is uh, an, an antibiotic uh, at a dosage of 100 milligrams twice a day. And within a period of weeks, they're back mobile and a lot of their problems go away. So I mentioned that for our listeners that may be struggling with this because it's, it's an interesting connection. And I, I, I get that there's not um, that there are downsides to antibiotics, too. But there's also a downside to being bedridden and in crippling pain 24 seven. It, it wears on your soul. Um, and and it does seem like acute use of minocycline to get you back to a place where you can move and, you know what I mean, do more for yourself could be a an intervention worth considering. The uh, Additionally, that uh, Manuka honey, also a super powerful antibiotic, natural antibiotic, right? So it's it, it, it could have been addressing leaky gut. It could have also been stimulating your body's own immune response and like kind of helping to get things over the edge. Um, the other thing, and this was from my experience, I hit by a tick for a second time and was like, knocked out for 24 hours, got a test, Lyme disease again. And I, I had pain returning to my body. And while we were looking for land uh, in North Carolina, I would go back and forth and I'd go to North Carolina and I'd camp by the river. And within days, the pain was gone. And then mm. I'd come back to Chicago or I'd come back to Florida, um, always near a big city, the pain would return. And I started thinking to myself, I'm like, is this Lyme or is this EMFs? You know, we've had on neurosurgeon, Dr. Jack Cruz, who brought this to my attention, Dr. Joseph Mercola, who wrote the book EMF, uh, Nick Pino, who wrote the non tinfoil guide to EMFs. And they started, they, they brought my attention to the fact that this stuff really irritates our nervous system and can cause inflammation um, that manifests as, as physical pain. So I tested it a whole bunch more times. Every time I was in nature, away from Wi-Fi, away from my cell phone, you know, uh, away from the smart meters that are in our homes, pain went away. And I talked to one of my buddies who's a, a, a Lyme physician. He's like, yeah, that ain't Lyme. That's, that's EMF. So um, as I dug a little bit deeper, I found out, well, EMFs also cause not only leaky brain, they, they, but also leaky gut. They actually start causing holes in, in, in our gut lining just by being exposed to Wi-Fi and cell phones and all of these things. So for a lot of people, and when we do this work with clients, we're having them dramatically reduce their exposure to wireless electrical radiation to allow the tight junctions in their gut to start to repair themselves. So it's like, yes, you can do it with, with uh, glutamine and, and other substances like that. But if you're microwaving yourself all day with wireless electrical radiation, you're still going to have leaky gut. And a lot of the toxins that are in your body are going to get into your brain because you're also degrading your blood brain barrier. Um, so those were just two insights that I wanted to share with our listeners, because I think they're both pretty important on this on this healing journey. And, 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 and I think both of us want as many people to get out of pain as we can. Was that clinic that you went to in Switzerland, Paracelsus, by chance? Do you know what? I don't remember the name of it. And I didn't go. I actually just researched it online and, and found that they were treating autoimmune patients. So I, you could be right. I just don't remember. It was too long ago and too many, too many trials ago. Yeah. But I just want to also say, um, just kind of dovetailing off of what you said, there are a lot of environmental toxins that we're all exposed to, as you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, and it's not just toxic people and, CNN, you know, there's a lot of toxic uh, stuff that we're we're dealing with. Um, whether it's the chemtrails in the sky, and, and I yeah. don't know, I don't know why, but I'm really happy to be part of the people uh, and the clan and the tribe that's saying, "Come on, everybody, let's hold hands and wake up a little bit," because yeah. uh, 
there's something going on that is not in our best interests. And perhaps if we just recognize that all we need is for everyone to be healthy and happy and take care of each other and perhaps not trust the powers that be so much. Mm -hmm. I can tell you from my own experience that the powers that be, I have met some really well-intentioned doctors, but they did not, they, they, they did not help me. They are limited in what they are able to offer you. Mm -hmm. um, and it is limited to the pharmaceutical um, industry. And that should be enough of a red flag to get that second opinion from a, a naturopath or, you know, listen to what I'm saying. There is another way. There's another way out and their way isn't the best way either. Yeah, that was um, that was a big realization for me in early 2020. Like when I wrote when I wrote my book, the the Biohacker's Guide to Upgrade Energy and Focus, I was like, man, there's a lot of toxins in things like it's in our water, it's in our food, it's in this, it's in that. And then early 2020, I was like, ah, it's intentional. You know, like it all clicked. And I was like, this ain't an accident. They're not like, they don't like think fluoride's good for our teeth. They know it's a neurotoxin. They don't think glyphosate is good for us. They know it's it, it, des it destroys our gut and this and that. And and then you start seeing the evidence. Like I'm actually getting a device to measure the air quality and the, mm. and the, the amount of toxins in the air when chemtrails are sprayed because you can measure it and you can see a huge increase. And, and for anyone that thinks chemtrails are a, conspiracy theory um you can look up there are literal geoengineering centers in china that you you can see this stuff being sprayed all the time if you have two eyes and i have a number of videos that i've shared as well of people showing the air quality before during and after chemtrails being sprayed and what's in there are aerosol aerosol heavy metals and toxins. So yep. it, it's not a conspiracy theory and it is something that we need to awaken to. And I would encourage anyone listening that cares about this stuff. Let's start putting our heads together on how we can stop the nonsense because yes, the powers that be in many cases, I don't think it's as simple as we make more money on you when you're sick. It's no. I don't think it's about that. These are people that created money as one of their control mechanisms. It's, it's paper to them. They print it as they need. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's much bigger. It's, it's a spiritual uh, journey and it is about control. And right. so we need to kind of start looking at things in that facet, not like, oh, they just make more money on us when we're sick. That ain't it. Right. My son always looks at me and says, it's like Austin Powers when he goes 70 billion trillion dollars. Austin didn't, you know, they didn't, he didn't need that money. The, the, I can't remember the dark guy. Dr. Dr. Evil. Dr. Evil. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't need the money. He was just making yeah. up a number because he already had all his, but it was the power yes. that he was after. And, you know, there it is. It's, it's, but it's, it's, I think it runs so complex and so deep and the web is insane mm -hmm. that, yeah, just to be aware of, holy cow, these are our elected officials and wait a minute, it doesn't matter who we elect, it's still going to happen. So, oh, yeah. And, and a lot of them are just, they're just appointed by, you know, I, I call them the central bankers to keep it to keep it simple, but these are the people that control the, cur the currency and the monetary system in just about every country. And a lot of it are people that have gone through the World Economic Forum and been appointed to positions of power. So we got to start waking up to that. And there's lists of everyone that's on the World Economic Forum. This is now becoming public. And, and I think people are rising up. And the answer is not to go head to head with them because they'll put you in jail. They'll make up a lie and try to put you in jail. Mm. But I do think that with us, uh, coming from a place of, of love and, and operating in a way that is in alignment with life and God's plan and truth, then we have the power to build a new earth and a better future for, uh, for our brothers and sisters and our grandchildren. Chills. Yes. And we can do it from the micro to the macro. If each of us takes responsibility for where we are, you know, mm -hmm. we, we put our boat in the water here, here we are. Okay. We're getting toxins at us get, you know, don't drink the fluoride water. Don't use the fluoride toothpaste. Get rid of the heavy metals in your get life. Get a shower filter. 
understand that there are toxins and then on a micro level, manage your own health, your family's health. And then from there, you know, spread the word, welcome people and say, Hey, you know, this, I, I understand this is happening. How can we keep you healthy and out of a doctor's office for as long as possible? For sure. And, and recognize, I don't, so I've been working on softening myself around this. Cause like when, you know, when I had that, like, ah, it's intentional moment. And then, uh, and, and then I was like, we're going to war, you know? And my mom's like, you're going to get whacked. You need to stop. Like she was like crying all the time. And, um, and, and it was a transition for me to refine equilibrium. Cause I went, you know what I mean? And, and I was, I was sending emails to like our 70,000 person list. And I'm like, do not take the poison. You know what I mean? And all this stuff. And, and every resource on, on jabba ding dongs that, that I had that would maybe help some people not do that stuff. But then you got to kind of come back and be like, all right, even these people are part of God's plan. And some of the most, the moments of greatest alignment that I've experienced have been like when I've done like a meditation and prayer with my brother and actually prayed for them, Mm. you know, said, wow, these people are really disconnected from God, their creator. And that's got to be hard. I hope that in some capacity, in some way, they can start to find their way back, you know? And, and there's a lot of, we, the more we know, there's a lot of childhood trauma there, like that, that is ingrained in the way that they're raised and, and to keep them in these loops. So I think there's, I mean, I'm trying to do it more often, even today, like on my run, I was praying for some of these people that I've perceived and, and, and previously perceived and at times still do perceive as enemies. And, and I'm doing my best to, to work in progress, but doing my best to see more of the world through God's eyes, which is that we are all one, even those that that we may think are against us. All right, sorry, um, I'm going on a lot of rants here. No, uh, just... That's so beautiful. And the ability to step back and to pray for someone else who is that person is is huge. I like to tell people, um, don't get mad at the kindergartner just because you have your master's. You know, there there's people on different mm. levels. Yeah. You've yeah, already yeah. gotten your degree and there's somebody sitting at the first grade table trying to understand it. And it just like you, I was blown away. It was it was too much. There was too much going on and the mm. realization of how complex and how deep everything went was extraordinary. Yeah. Um, but there is a time, a moment where you just stop and go, I can't control everything out there, but I can control how I show up mm-hmm. and I will love and pray for you because my existence, you know, our time and our energy are limited. They're the greatest assets we have. So, um, it's, it's showing up with the energy, putting out love and compassion and upliftment into the world and not the negative and this is crappy because that's what they want. They want us mm-hmm. to feel the negative and the sad and the scared. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. not buying into that, but I love it. A hundred percent. And well, you reminded me of something, but I lost it. I lost it. So let's move on. What other implements were helpful to you on your journey? Like what are the, did, did you utilize, like when I, when my body was hurting, sauna was really helpful. Like getting in the sauna and heating my body up. You know, and doing like really hot, I call them biohacker baths, you know, those baths with like Epsom salts and baking soda and even 35% food grade hydrogen peroxide. Like did, what did, what else did you dip into that, that was helpful for you? All of it. Um, my, I did all, <laughs> I literally thing. did. I did the hydrogen peroxide. I did the boron, the borax rather, yeah. you know, there's, yeah. I did apple cider vinegar. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm featured in the new Bragg's uh, apple cider vinegar. The, Get out of here. They, they, well, they. They wrote a book um, with Kenny Loggins' wife, Julia Loggins, um, who- Love Highway to the Danger Zone. Love it. Yeah. Kenny actually did the foreword for this book and they featured me and my story in this book. And it was just so funny. I'm like, well, there's that circle. You know, it's called Revolutionary Beauty. It's amazing about how um, the beauty on the inside kind of comes out. But anyway, the, yes, I did all of that. Um, luckily enough, I, you know, I have the funds to be able to purchase a far infrared sauna. I have one in my house. I have a biomat that I nice. absolutely swear by. It's been my sanctuary for all these years. Do you sleep uh, on it? I don't. It's a little hard. It's hard. It is a little hard. I tried, I, 
I tried sleeping on it, and it was just, I was like, not, not for me. But I yeah. do spend a lot of time on it still. Um, yeah. And, you know, I do all of that. I'm, I'm lucky I live in Santa Barbara, so I do my Wim Hof in the ocean here. Oh, that's... Be, listeners, be careful. I do it in water, too, but there have been people that have had shallow water blackouts, I've heard. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, I, I like doing it in water, too, and looking toward the sun. It's it's very it's very rare and few and far between, but they had to start telling people because like some people would go so hard and then they'd be in water and they'd be like, Rip. you know, if you're like speed, like I'm saying to the listeners, guys, consult, you know, be safe. No, absolutely. I, I, do, I do it in water, too. And I look toward the sun and all that. I love it, you know. But there's all those modalities out there, Anthony. There's so many different ways of releasing trauma, releasing toxins. I was sitting with somebody yesterday who is an emotional resistance stretching specialist, and he actually does the fascia breakthrough or breaking with an emotional support. So Mm. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Bob Cooley's work. He's the genius mm. of flexibility. He does resistance stretching to break open fascia, which is your connective tissue. But the theory behind that is that there's biofilms in your connective tissue that's holding the myotoxins and the microtoxins and the cellular memory and the emotional trauma, all of it. So mm-hmm. that when you release that, the trauma comes up and it presents itself to be released. And this person that I was sitting with was an emotional support person for your uh, myofascial release. And it was just brilliant. And I thought there are so many amazing modalities um, to you. So I do all, I did all of it. I love all of it. For me, the far infrared sauna, I still do the, the boron borax uh, once in a while. Um, it really, internally, it, internally, yeah, no, okay. it chelates the the any type of heavy metals in your body. Okay. You tel- chelate, chelates. I don't know the right word. Chelates. Sorry. No, no, um, it's everyone gets it. Apple cider vinegar, you know, that's staple in my in my life, and obviously being out in nature as much as I can and finding joy. I also let everybody else off the hook. That's a big internal decision where I take 100% responsibility for where I am and where I'm at at all times. And that started with my disease. Um, I, I don't blame anybody. I don't want, I don't blame my government. I don't blame, I know yeah. that there's crap going on, but ultimately it's between me and me. Um, yeah, they, didn't, they didn't put it in our mouths. Yeah. Well, and also you have the option of really kind of captaining your own ship. And so mm-hmm. when you cut everybody else, it, which is really hard in a marriage, because I really enjoyed blaming my husband for everything. And, you know, <laughs> sure he loved it, too. He, oh, it was great. But um, I'll be on the horse. No, so, yeah. And I said, you know what? From this moment on, you're n- I, you win. I really don't have the time or the energy to give you. It's, it's not your responsibility to make me healthy or happy. Mm-hmm. I need to take care of my own life. And in doing that, you kind of just go, okay, when something really great happens, I did that. When something really crappy happens, I did that. And I'm here. Mm -hmm. And I, not that I did it in terms of a blame, but who's going to get me out of this? Nobody. And that's where I think with disease and with healing, we put so much focus on these professionals to get us out. And ultimately you have to pull yourself out. You have Mm -hmm. to be your own guru and your own hero. And you do that by being well-informed. Thank goodness for you, Anthony. And, and understanding that there are ways, you know, we don't have to walk around trusting in ignorance, a hundred percent what these doctors are saying. You can go and, and just Google, you know, Dr. Google is amazing. I, I, I mean, I fell on my face quite a few times with Dr. Google and, but it, it ultimately, it helped me find my path to healing. Yeah. There's, um, are you familiar with John, John Prine? No, I'm not. One of, one of my friend played me this song in like early 2020 and it's, it, it's called Spanish pipe dream, but it's like, I mean, it's a hilarious song, but the lyrics I think are some of the best guidelines in separating ourselves from a little bit of the grip that, uh, our television, our phone, you know, our computers, our electronic devices can have over us, you know, especially as it pertains to disinformation and the, uh, the, the dissemination of propaganda. And he would, 
uh, so the, the chorus, it goes, blow up your TV, do, 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 do. throw away your paper, do, 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 do. go to the country, do, 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 do. build you a home, plant a little garden, eat a lot of peaches, try to find Jesus on your own. And it was like, I was like, wow, what great advice. It's like, doesn't need to be super complicated. It's about getting back to life and nature and God and family and having more discernment to realize that so much of what comes through our electronics, like not only do we have the electronics themselves, like I mentioned earlier, but then you have the fact that that's their propagation tool and it's pretty sophisticated. And we now know that they heavily leverage mind control techniques and, and we've seen that, you know, 70 to 80 percent of people, whether they know it or not, maybe me too. But I, I've never I, I can't be hypnotized when my buddies is like an awesome hip, uh, hypnotist. And he's like I, he's like 20 percent of people that like can't be hypnotized. He goes, I think they're the ones that are most outside of the mind control. But the people that are like must take the stuff, you know, it's it's like it's not only that we may be at different parts of the journey which I think can also be a bit of a trap because you're coming at it from like an ego place. Like, Oh, I might just be, you know, I've got a master's and they've got whatever, but right. they also might be hypnotized, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and part of that could just be spent spending too much time staring at the screens. So anyway, mm -hmm. I wanted to mention I that. Totally agree. What would you do differently if you had to do it all over again? Nothing, nothing. I would take all the failures. I would take the pain. I would take everything because I didn't realize who I was when I got sick and now I do, and there's no going back once you know your own empowerment. And once you step into your own sovereignty, there's no going back from there. And, and honestly, I don't, I couldn't imagine doing anything different. I would take the pain over and that's saying a lot because RA is ridiculously painful. It's mm -hmm. uh, I, I see people that have it and they're coming to me and I, I, I remember it was so painful. I mean, it's, it's just from one thing to the next and it's hard to focus on anything when you're in that much pain, you are just focusing mm -hmm. on the pain. Yeah. Um, it can make you almost bitter. Made, it made me like a little bit quick, quick to anger, quick to sadness, sure. quick to those like negative emotions. It's just like everything hurt all the time, you know? For sure. But I think for most of us, um, we have to get that large giant kick in the derriere Mm -hmm. Um, a little shove doesn't seem to do the trick to yeah. transform and to change or to rather to recognize who we are. So I wouldn't have changed a thing. I'm glad I, I made the choices that I made for sure. I'm glad I, um, took it upon myself to heal. And I'm, I didn't know I was going to heal when I was going through it, but now in retrospect, I think that it was the, yeah, I wouldn't have changed anything. I'm mm -hmm. so glad that I'm on the other side, shining the light now for sure. Yeah, yeah, totally. And it's, it's a constant learning process. Like the first time I got Lyme, I was so bummed out and sad and this and that. And then afterwards when I was like feeling better, I'm like, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And it was like so clear that it was that, that my pain was this gift. Right. And then I get it again and I'm like, mother, like rather than like, oh, what are the opportunities here? How much good is going to come out of this? I'm like, not again. You know, last couple of questions. <laughs> I want to be respectful of your time and, and, and we'll kind of land this plane. And, and But I think there's some some things that you might be able to shed light on that could be helpful for our listeners. What What's perhaps the most effective trauma release modality or intervention that you were able to apply? Like... I'm hearing amazing things just about letting yourself sob and what it does for the brain and like rewiring our, our uh, neurochemistry and our, you know, our neurological system. It's almost like a reset for the brain. And my whole life, I was just like, men don't cry. Men don't cry. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And my brother was, my brother was the opposite. He would like let himself cry. And he's like, it's not healthy what you do. <laughs> You know, and he kind of started <laughs> pointing out some of it. You know, I learned it from my dad and my brother was uh, smarter than I am. So he allowed himself to experience emotions. But like, what, what's it been for you that you found to be helpful? Yeah, trauma release is huge. I think just an awareness of our programming, an awareness that um, we all come into this world and we are immediately programmed, whether it be culturally, um, you know, through religion, through your neighborhood, through the men, the women, like it's just, there's so much programming that 
hits you right off the bat that may not be authentically yours. And so I think for, for me, the first thing was an awareness. Wait a minute. If I keep peeling back all these layers of what I was taught in kindergarten. And, you know, for me, interestingly enough, in kindergarten, I tried to run a race and I remember it vividly because all the kids were running around the track and the PE teacher came up to me and said, you know what, darling, you're not a very good athlete. Why don't you just sit and watch these kids? And yeah. And I remember just going, okay. And I spent my entire life never participating in a PE class because I knew I would suck at it. So I carried that programming that didn't even belong to me. But at that age, I just, of course, if I'm being told that, that's what I am. I mean, I never questioned it. It never occurred to me. It took a lot of uh, digging and going inside. Again, it's that inner work. It's that it's having the courage to face yourself Mm-hmm. on a on an authentic level and just really start peeling back the layers with compassion and with love and with a recognition of okay this is the work it's beautiful work it's deep work it's hard work and i did employ um some healers you know i've done reiki sessions that have helped me um heal i i worked with pranic energy healers who help clear energy i'm i'm all about crystals and and burn more sage than probably should be burnt <laughs> Set up fire alarms with all my sage burning luckily santa barbara it grows wild here so i oh, have, that's cool. I, I feel like i've helped trim all the state sage by going that saves, out and, that saves you some money it does. oh my gosh when covid hit i was burning more sage that like i was just but anyway um yeah. so i would definitely say that a recognition of the fact that we do have to heal and that it's our responsibility. It's nobody else's. It's on us. I like that. And and also recognizing like, where did our trauma originate from? And then how do we pass this trauma on to future generations? Mm. And and where are we just blindly accepting, you know, whether it's medical dogma or any other type of dogma, like if you think about it, a, a baby is, is birthed into this world and it's under bright fluorescent lights and then it's ripped away from its mother and then they clip the ween and like, you know what I mean? It's like, that's super traumatic. The baby's like, what the heck is going on? It was so nice and warm and peaceful in there. And now there's a guy like cutting my dick, you know, like that's trauma that we don't even discuss. It's like, we need to look at some of these things if we're, if, you know, all right. Anyway, um, last, last question. When you, when you're, and then I'll kind of, you know, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, Josette T and and what people can can go there and check out and everything, um, all the good stuff that you offer. When you when you spend time in nature, what do you do? Oh, I'm super lucky. I have my husband is a horseman, mm-hmm. so uh, I have a horse that he got for me only because I never saw him. <laughs> He's at the barn from six a.m. to eight p.m. So. Um, he bought me a retired, uh, dressage horse, which is a dancing horse. Whoa. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And she's my, she's literally like my Labrador retriever. So I spend time with her, um, just hanging out, grazing. Sometimes I ride. She's, she's a lot like me in that if I ask her to run, she kind of says, why don't you get off and you run and I'll watch you kind of a thing. So <laughs> she's that uh, she's very much at my tempo. The cool thing is that, um, we have a great relationship. So I, I, I spend time with my animals with, uh, we, we unschooled our son this year. He's 13 and nice move. Um, power move. Yeah, it really was. We got him a whole bunch of chickens and, um, he has responsibilities at the barn. So we spend, we spend a lot of time just hanging out with the animals unplugged and, uh, communing with nature and we're growing our own food. So, yeah, that's, that's where I am most of the time. And I'm really blessed because then I come home and get dressed and just go dance. Yeah, that is freaking awesome. Well, I mean, this has been a really fun conversation and, uh, I, I went on a bunch of rants. Hopefully you didn't glaze over and be like, Oh, is this guy going to let me talk or what? These uh, are the conversations I could have all day, every day, because it's not, you know, when we talked about this before we went on is that finding like-minded people who aren't going to bully you and call you a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. We're going to talk about that and then then wrap it up. 
it's important to find people that you know nobody needs to bully anybody. I have so many people. I I always tell people my husband and I disagree all the time, but I've never once called him a name um, and tried <laughs> to shut him up. I want to yeah. hear what he. I want to hear his opinion. It's it's kind of really important, you know. That doubting Thomas is the key to everything. So we have to ask questions all the time and support each other in those questions. Mm-hmm. And and find ways to be courageous enough to compassionately speak our truth so that it's easier for us to find our tribe. Mm -hmm. If we're quiet and we're afraid to say what we really feel, then yeah, you're probably going to feel pretty lonely in this journey, Mm -hmm. you know, but as you put it out there more and more from a place of, of integrity and, and love and compassion, which I haven't done the whole time. Sometimes I've been, sometimes I've been a a little bit abrasive, I admit, but it's a, a, a work in progress. And when you do that, m- more and more people are like, hey, I, I, I think that too. You know what I mean? I've seen that too. Like, what? You know what I mean? What's, right. what's the move? How do we like, how, how are you going off grid? Tell me about that. You know, how do you grow your own biodynamic food? What's this, what's this food forest thing? I want to get a horse. That sounds like more fun than a Chevy, you know? Um, okay, Awesome. And yeah, then- no, and and again, just to to finish that off, it, it isn't. It's important that we l- treat all of humanity with compassion. That's mm-hmm. one of the things that just befuddled me, and I'm being nice about it, and I'm sure it irritated the crap out of you as well. Is why are we bullying each other? Why are we demeaning each other? Mm-hmm. No, like the, we're supposed to ask questions just because somebody says, "Hey, this doesn't seem right," and I wonder if this is possible. That's not a conspiracy theorist. That's asking the questions. And I tell you, when I first started speaking about healing disease, I was called a quack right and left. In fact, I kept silent for many years because I was being told, oh, you're giving misinformation. People are going to eat healthy, my God, and be positive, and they should just go to the doctors and take the drugs. And I and I was really bullied. I was really bullied, and I fell for it. And now I'm like, wait a minute we all are sovereign beings and I'm not going to sit here and deny that I healed a disease. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to deny my own path because there is someone out there that may be looking for that light or looking for that hope. And Mm -hmm. if they can grasp it by hearing my story and then making their own story and then them grasping it and being a light for somebody else, That's what we're here for. We're not here to be bullied. And so the person that is telling you you're a conspiracy theorist or to shut up or to be silenced is the person you need to bless and walk away from. Yeah. And or if it's on social media, just block them. I mean, I've I've blocked so many people in the past two years. At first, I'd be like, at first I was like, I'm going to give them a couple strikes. And now I'm just like, nope, that was really mean. That was really rude. You know what I mean? Yeah. Get your own stuff handled if you're going to talk like that on my page, you know, about my post or about me or whatever. And it's incredibly liberating. <laughs> you just yeah. end up with people that are much more aligned. And, uh, and and anyway, it's less overwhelming. You're not like getting the, you know, the people in the nosebleeds like cackling at you. Um, yeah. And I don't mind, you know, I have plenty of friends that, that feel very strongly on the flip side. But oh, me too. I think, Tons. I think that it's so vital to be able to coexist or else yeah. what are you going to have? It's like you're looking at a, a, a field of flowers and they're all purple. You mm-hmm. know, it's flowers are beautiful when they're yellow and red and orange and all these different colors. You need variety. It's the spice of life. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, I agree. I was, you know, for a while I was like, oh, we we're, we're our opinions are so different on this. But then I was like, wait, these are like my friends of like 20 plus years. And, you know, I, I, I just had to, I had to adjust. Like I said, I was, I was the pendulum kind of fix, finding equilibrium. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, josette.t.com and what people can find there and what, what, what it's all about? Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, they can find, uh, I have, my story is there and I have a course called Heal that is there available and that sets out in detail um, exactly how I healed RA, kind of what we talked about here, but a little bit more detail of exactly the the, the things that I did, the modalities mm-hmm. and the process that I used. Protocols. And um, then there's some Zumba classes, some live film Zumba classes that are there, some meditations, 
There's a whole bunch of stuff. And if you're in Santa Barbara, there are ways to get to my class to sign up for the live class. That's pretty awesome. I've been wanting to get better at dancing. Maybe I'll try one of your uh, Zumba classes. That sounds there. You go. Give it. That a sounds shot. fun. See the see the master at work. Well, thank you so much for this conversation, uh, Josette. I had a blast, and uh, hopefully, you know, everyone else did too. And guys, if if you like this, please share this episode. You know, that's how we can bring you this information for free. And and go to uh, Josette J O S E T T E T dot com. Pick up her heel course. Let her know that you appreciate her sharing her time, energy, and wisdom with us by also supporting her. That's a good way for energy to flow and, uh, you know, support the things that you want more of in this world. Uh, just that anything else that you'd like to, to share with our listeners before we sign off? No, and just an absolute group. Thank you and privilege to be talking to you today, Anthony. These are, like I said, golden conversations. Thank you. Thank you.